and welcome to Business Line. Tensions inside EDF over its plans to build a nuclear power station in the UK led to the resignation of the French company's finance director. He quit saying the project could threaten the company's future. Reportedly, he wasn't the only one with other senior executives at the French state-controlled utility also finding the plan too risky. In this edition, we take a closer look at the company's ambitious projects in Europe to see why they're so expensive, so complicated to operate, and so controversial, rather, like nuclear energy itself. Let's start with costs. Normally, this is how it works. The more experience there is of a particular technology, the less it costs to build. This is what has happened with renewables like wind and solar power. Nuclear, however, is a different story. And the price tag for the Hinkley Point C project underlines that. French utility firm EDF says it will not delay a decision on building two nuclear reactors at this site in the southwest of England, even though the company's finance director has quit in protest because he says the project is too risky. Thomas Pickmal believes the 23 billion euro cost of the Hinkley Point power plant could threaten EDF's stability and future, given that it's already under major financial pressure. They cut operational costs, I believe, by something like 300 million euros last year. There's another 700 million euros to come out this year, but frankly, this is a drop in the ocean compared to the um, financing commitments that the company um, supposedly has to make, um, particularly in respect of Hinkley Point. The project is a partnership between French state-controlled EDF and Chinese group CGN. And the French and British governments both say they still back it, despite concerns raised even by some of EDF's directors who want a decision delayed. One cannot help but feel that there is a political dimension to all of this, not only in respect of um, perhaps interference from the French government, which at the end of the day still owns 85% of EDF, uh, perhaps, but uh, from the UK government as as well um, because this is a, is a flagship project and of course it all comes against the backdrop of, um, of the ongoing Brexit debate. Indeed the project is central to Britain's energy strategy to replace its aging nuclear plants. After Pickmal's resignation the French economy minister insisted Hinkley Point will be profitable even though it's based on a prototype reactor facing technical problems, big delays and cost overruns designed by Arriva, a loss-making mostly French state-owned company. As a proven source of low carbon power that can be delivered as needed, nuclear accounts for around 10% of the total electricity generated around the world. Nuclear accounts for around 27% of the electricity used in the European Union, with nuclear reactors operating in 14 member states. The largest producer of nuclear power in the EU by far is France, with just under 50% of the total, and French companies are industry leaders. In the nuclear industry, safety is paramount, and that's what makes it so controversial. The Hinkley Point project should be safer, possibly even the safest in the world. The reactors due to be used there are called European Pressurized Reactors, EPR. They are the latest generation of pressurized water reactors designed and developed mainly by the French firm Areva together with Electricité de France. How are they different? They are promoted as being more powerful and safer. However, it's impossible to say that for certain as no EPR units are in operation. Finland was the first European country to order the technology. Olkiluoto 3 is Areva's first such project. There is also an EDF-led EPR project at Flamanville in France. What do they have in common? Both are dramatically behind schedule and massively over budget. As I said, safety is a number one priority and with regard to that, no government would dare cut corners to save money. The disaster at Fukushima in 2011 led to a temporary shutdown of plants in Japan and even convinced some countries to phase out nuclear power entirely. And it colors the debate among the Japanese people. 
There's controversy in Japan over tourist visits to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear site. For now, only media tours like this one are allowed. But some locals who survived the tsunami that followed a magnitude 9 earthquake five years ago want the nuclear power plant to be a center of so-called dark tourism. The head of the group behind the idea, Hiroki Azuma, says for now, opposition is too strong. He says most Japanese simply are not capable of supporting or even understanding that it is possible to turn a major disaster into something that will bring people over or that building a museum that would show the facts of the disaster could provide a good lesson for future generations. There's a Fukushima tourism center in Japan's capital, Tokyo, staffed by people from the region, which sells food produced there, which has been checked to make sure it's safe. The tourism center staff are divided about this. Some support the idea of showing visitors the aftermath of what happened, but this center worker doesn't think it should be commercialized. I don't believe we should be employing the word tourism to that region, says Marika Matsumoto. So, unlike Chernobyl in Ukraine, scene of a 1986 nuclear reactor disaster, the Fukushima plant will not be an official tour site, though there are visits to the area run by local volunteers. Ironically, Hiroki Azuma, the man behind the plan for Fukushima to become a major tourist destination, organizes tours taking Japanese people to Chernobyl. The Financial Times reports the Fukushima nuclear disaster has cost Japanese taxpayers almost $100 billion. Ritsumeikan University professor Kinichi Oshima has estimated this amount is mainly being paid by the public, either through their electricity bills or as higher taxes. This huge amount highlights the difficulty of holding a private company to account for the immense expense of nuclear accidents a concern for all countries that are building new nuclear power stations. Times have really changed down at Redmond. Microsoft announced something that not too long ago would have been unthinkable. SQL Server, its flagship database software, will now be available on Linux. For those of you unfamiliar with the Penguin, as it's called because of its mascot, Linux is an open source operating system. While not widespread on personal computers, Linux is a serious threat to Windows when it comes to servers. According to research firm Gardner, 3.6 million Linux servers were shipped in 2014, compared with 2.4 million in 2011. The number of Windows servers, on the other hand, fell from 6.5 million to 6.2 million. Until recently, Microsoft's strategy was centered on the so-called stack, Simply put, it means they always try to lock in business customers by selling applications that work exclusively with its operating system. But, just as some consumers like Apple, some enterprises have a clear preference for Linux, so CEO Satya Nadella decided to change the approach. After making many Microsoft apps available for iOS and Android, he's moved to the data management space. It's an expansion opportunity, he says. The risk of making Linux more attractive is offset by the opportunity to widen SQL's market share beyond Windows. That was it. That was IT. That was it for now. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next week.